section, this is um, a student presentation, so if you're um, judging presentations, this is an undergraduate student. Um, this is Olivia Heath from the Biology Department at Allegheny College, and she's going to be talking to us today about her senior comp project um, on salamanders. All right, to give you some background information regarding this topic, um, amphibians and climate are, go very hand in hand. Now, there is widespread evidence that climate change is happening worldwide, and the amphibian populations are especially vulnerable to, this, to these changes. Um, among the changes can include morphological change, disease vulnerability, rain shifts, population decline, and even extinction. Um, and with amphibians, they live in wetlands, but temporary wetlands in particular are more vulnerable to climate change due to changes in hydro period, which means earlier drying seasons and later wet seasons. Now, there is actually a recent study that shows that northeastern U.S. is warming at a greater rate than the entire U.S. Um, so elsewhere in the U.S., if it were to warm to 2 degrees Celsius, the northeastern U.S. would have warmed to 3 degrees. Now, the focus on this study in particular is on salamanders that migrate to these temporary woodland wetlands in northwestern PA. Now, the salamander that I study is the Ambisoma maculatum, otherwise known as the spotted salamander, and I'm sure that some of you may have seen this because it is a local species. Now, for those of you who don't know the Ambisoma life cycle, they tend to live in the forest and they migrate to ponds in the spring where they lay their eggs and then they develop into a terrestrial adult where they migrate back into the forest for the rest of their lives. Um, over winter they will actually bury into the ground and hibernate until temperature is warm enough for them to migrate back to the ponds for breeding. Now for climate change effects, they can affect several different things regarding these salamanders. Um, the migration timing, pond drying, and their overwinter conditions. And I'll get to this back at the end of the presentation. <coughs> now my study goals were to examine climactic variables that can trigger migration in order to predict effects of changing climate. Um, so in my studies, I found that very few and possibly no studies have actually extensively examined soil temperatures in which that these salamanders reside in over winter. Um, and for this particular study, I used a long-term study population at the Allegheny College Research Reserve called Busan. And this is what it looks like. So here, there we go. Here you can sort of see the pond fences that I'll be discussing in a moment. Uh, there are six pond, or five ponds, uh, ponds one, two, three, and four as a group, and then pond six over here on the far right. And here you can see where it is on the general map of Pennsylvania. Now for my methods, I established <coughs> three transects extending away from these pond groupings uh, along known migration paths in December of 2017. So, and then I placed hobo loggers at hobo data loggers at these four dis at four distances along each transect on one meter stakes. Um, you can see the setup on here on the right. There were three depths that I wanted to record for temperature. There was air temperature, topsoil temperature, and 20 centimeters below the ground. Uh, and then at the end of the study, I captured and recorded uh, the size and the sex of all 1,533 salamanders using established drift, drift fences and pitfall traps in the spring of 2018. And here you can see the drift fences, which is just aluminum fencing that sticks out on the ground, uh, prevents the salamanders from actually getting into the ponds, and it directs them into these pitfall traps where we collected them. And here you can see the tra three transects that I established. Uh, the transect A and B are on a south face of the bowl that surrounds the, these ponds. And transect C at the bottom leads to pond six, which is on a north face. Um, the transects were established at certain degrees and angles, uh, in particular avoiding this coniferous forest where the soil is too acidic for salamanders to prefer 
over, over winter hibernation. Um, and each transect is 90 meters in length with uh, determined points of measurement every 30 meters starting at the ponds themselves. And again, the temperature depths were 20 centimeters below the ground, topsoil temperatures, and air temperatures. For the next couple of graphs, they'll follow a, uh, a pattern. All the highlighted orange dots indicate salamander movement and capture. So there were more than one salamander caught that day. The circled points here indicate the highest number of salamanders caught at that particular transect, um, which happened to be all the same day for all of them. Um, but this graph in particular indicates precipitation values over the entirety of Busan area. Now, we had a bit of an issue early on in the, in our temperature recordings, um, there was a sudden warm up, and we expected salamander movement to be coming in during this early warm up, which you can see right here, um, where it got really rainy as well. But, however, we didn't see that. But we do know that, based on previous research, uh, research studies, that salamanders will not move unless it is rainy or at least a very humid night. Now these are the average temperatures for each, tra each relative transect, uh, transect A, B, and C. Um, and so following these average temperatures, we can find sort of a threshold pattern. For air temperature, the threshold was roughly around zero degrees Celsius. For the uh, topsoil temperature, the threshold was around two degrees Celsius, which you can see indicated by this line here. And for 20 centimeters below the surface, it was roughly around three degrees Celsius. And again, you can see the sudden warm up that occurred during these early days, and then the sudden cooling and dry period in which no salamanders migrated. So not only did we measure precipitation and temperature values, but we also looked at de heating degree days. Now, for cumulative heating, this, this degree day equation was based off an existing equation that's used by ecologists and agronomists. The equation itself is the maximum temperature minus the minimum te temperature divided by two minus a base temperature. Now, our base temperature was set to zero degrees Celsius, as these salamanders will not migrate if temperatures are below freezing. Um, so, in the end, our equation was just the max temperature minus min minimum temperature divided by two. And then we added up these degree days across days over the course of the study period. And these next few graphs will show this. Now, again, the, the my south end of migration days are highlighted there for their respective transects. Um, I included the values for these cumulative degree days just to give you a sense of uh, comparison between the transects. All the highlighted blue indicates a day of rain. Um, and again, we can sort of see a threshold pattern. Uh, for the male salamanders, they migrated earlier, and the female salamanders migrated later, and I'll show you that in just a few seconds. So the previous graph was for air temperature, for air degree days. Uh, this is the topsoil degree days, and you can see that they all sort of follow this relative pattern. And then for 20 centimeters below the ground degree days, the transect C tended to warm up far less quickly than transects A and B, also because we think it's due to the fact that transect C is on the north face, which means it's not getting as much sun as the south facing slopes as transects A and B. Now here are the, uh, populate, the sex population percentages. Um, we have males, again, tended to come in much earlier at much higher, num in much higher numbers. Uh, and then the sex percentages so sort of shifted over to females later on in the season. Um, and here we can see the numbers that we received. We received almost tw as twice as many males as we did females. Um, and the female capture ratios actually favored females more than 
males during April 12th and April 15th. So for the conclusions, salamanders migrate, which is already known, when precipitation is present and when temperature thresholds are met. But based on this study, because temperature hasn't been, haven't been measured for soil, uh, we were able to establish those thresholds. So air, zero degrees Celsius, topsoil is two degrees Celsius, and 20 centimeters below is three degrees Celsius. However, all this in conjunction with cumulative heating thresholds really establishes a major point of estimating when they would be coming in. So with climate change effects on migration, shifts in pre precipitation and wet and dry periods for these temporary wetlands will affect migration. Uh, shifts in temperature thresholds and cumulative heating will also greatly affect their migration patterns. Um, but when combined, these can definitely cause a lot of uh, turmoil for these salamanders and determinations for when they should migrate or not. Um, and based on historical data for this perspective, for this particular population, females would actually be more affected than males by all these changes because of historical mark and recapture data for this, pop for this particular population. It has been shown that males will migrate every single year, but fe females will only migrate when conditions meet certain criteria, which means that they can skip years of migration and not migrate at all. Thank you for listening. Uh, are there any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Do you foresee climate change if um, affecting <coughs> when the females lay the eggs and the eggs, you know, developing to um, offspring? Do you see the climate change? Uh, affecting that, so taking it a step further, it's going to affect their migrations, but how would it affect the development of the offspring? Well, the offspring, they do spend the their developmental stages in water and wetland uh, environments, so if wetland dry periods are happening earlier and earlier within the season, then they'd have to either adapt and speed up their developmental process, which includes morphological changes, or they would die. Yeah, time for more questions. So I, I, I noticed you, you mentioned um, humidity is one of the factors that, that um, affected migration. So it, do you think it's possible, or did you collect any information about, about the, the kind of relative humidity day to day, or could you do something similar with soil moisture to look at how that uh, I didn't measure humidity, um, but soil mo moisture, it really depended uh, based on the transect I was looking at, because transect A happened to go through a sort of small marshland right next to a stream, so there was a lot more moisture in that particular transect than transect C, which was very dry in comparison. Um, but no, I did not look at humidity percentages explicitly. Um, so it seems like there's a lot of males available. Um, how do they compete against each other? Are they aggressive, like males aggressive against other males, or? Um, I don't believe so. I'm pretty sure it's first come, first serve. Yeah. <laughs> so climate change in terms of them picking up on the cues and getting there and establishing space would be? Yes, um, they would have to migrate early enough that they would be ready for the females to come in, but they would have to migrate late enough that they wouldn't be caught in another freezing. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mike, did you have a question before? Do you have any sense that this population is stable or decreasing over time? Um, well, I didn't look at the... So there is a population examination trend for the past two decades actually conducted by Professor Wissinger. Um, so you can ask him about that. Increase. <laughs> <laughs> Increase. Yeah, go ahead. So, so this is just kind of a general question about the salamander. So if a female skips a year, does that does she does she lay more eggs than the following year? I'm unsure. Do you know? Yes. <laughs> 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 it's always nice to have help from the audience. But 
not twice what she left, she came in two consecutive years. So it's less than she so she came in the two years old. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for Olivia? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So the talk really should be pre-preliminary because it's, this is preliminary to preliminary. And what, what I'm really going to talk about is pretty basic. But typically, when I come up here, it's to look at the aquatic and wetland vegetation of the park. And so this summer, I decided, you know, I'm up here too many times. I love coming up here um, from the Pittsburgh area. But it'd be nice to do something different, um, just something basic, something different to get out on the water. And yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually look at plants, but this was a chance to do it. And so I know you want to know what's going on here. And you ever have that moment where you, you're, my br him falling into the water, and, and no, I'm not pulling him into the water. I know it looks like it. Um, and, and believe it or not, we actually saved him. He did not, he did not go in. But when we were out in the water and this kind of happened, it, it got me thinking, what's going on in the inner lagoon? And so I really owe the, this group of high school students that, I can't remember how many years ago that was, maybe 13 or 14, but we had a lot of fun out there. He had more fun than anybody. But it, it got me thinking, what's going on in the inner, inner lagoon? What's going on in, in Big Pond, Long Pond, and those systems out there? And we found there's really very little information. And one of the things I also wanted to know was the, excuse me, the, the phytoplankton communities out there. So Jeanette was kind enough to help me. And so if I leave her enough time, she's going to talk to you a little bit about what's going on from that standpoint. But really, this is just to kind of get some ideas. And I'm really looking for help. So I'm really looking for questions or some advice, because we'd really like to develop this uh, for next year and kind of uh, have a more full-blown study, because what you're going to see is, is pretty basic. In fact, there's more things we didn't measure than we did measure. And it was just really taking the probe out there, getting some basic measurements, just to kind of characterize what's going on in the water column. And being a plant ecologist, I really gravitated to looking at the aquatic vegetation beds. And if you spend any time, and I'll show you some, some pictures here, if you spend any time out in the inner lagoon system, <clears throat> excuse me, there are extensive emergent beds. There are extensive submergent beds and we want to know what's going on with them as well. But I really want to know what's the effect of these emergent and submergent beds on the water quality. And so this is something just with some basic measurements that we started to look at. But we also have to tie the phytoplankton and the algae into this as, as well. And so that's what we're going to kind of, kind of look at here as, as we go along. So here is, here is um, the, the park. And our work, and I'll show you on the next slide as well, is going to take place right, um, right over here in the, in the lagoon system and Big Pond and, and Long Pond. But we looked at, at several of these vegetation beds. Nufar, which is your spatter dock, your, your yellow water lily, uh, the polygonum or your water amphibium, that, um, uh, water smartweed that's out there, Brazinia, which is the water shield. And then we also compared it to the open water channels. And there's a number of these embayments off the channel as well, fairly shallow. So you have a difference as we look at, at these channels, you look at these small embayments, you look at the beds, there's differences in water levels. So there's a lot of different things. It's a, it's a fairly diverse system out there. And so here's pretty much where we're looking at. So if you look at this aerial photo, you can see here's Long Pond. Here's um, going all the way through here. Here's Big Pond over here. This is a fairly large system. So I don't know how many of you have canoed out there. But we were trying to get all of this sampling done with, within the same time, time frame, same window each time we would go out. And it's kind of hard to do when you're canoeing. Now, I'd let Jeanette do all the canoeing, and I would just kind of sit back and relax. 
but it's still slow going. And so I think next year, if we go out there, we're going to put a little trolling motor on the back, some, rig something up, so we can get to more sites. But we pretty much had to focus in this area here, as opposed to down here. But we did take, take samples throughout. So you can see even that, that's about as far as we got. Then we would drive over here. It, was, it just too, took too long to try to canoe. But it's fairly diverse out here in terms of what's going on. So let me show you. So here are some of the um, uh, emergent beds. Here's your, your uh, Brazinia, your water shield. Here's your, uh, your um, Nufar, your spatter dock. And right here is, is your water smartweed. These are fairly extensive, very dense beds. And they're sitting in anywhere uh, from two to four feet of water. So they go fairly deep. And so the question is, how is this differing than what's going on in your, your open water areas, your channel areas, and is it having an effect on the, on the water column? And I said, there's a number of things we didn't measure, such as light. We need to measure nutrients. I'm very interested in, uh, in what's going on in the interaction then with, with the phytoplankton as, as well. And we looked at cover just to kind of gauge the, um, the extensiveness. And in the water shield beds, it was um, about 70% cover just of the water shield. A lot of ceratophyllum, <clears throat> ceratophyllum coontail in there. You can't really see it from this picture but it was, it was fairly dense. And these submergent beds are going to have an impact as, as well. Here's your new far, very extensive canoeing through these is not easy as well. And it, it's about 90% um, or more in terms of, of cover. And then we had the smartweed beds. And these smartweed beds are a little bit different. And I'm just going to show you some DO profiles here. And, and they're a little unique because the majority of the biomass for these beds is all at the top. Whereas the, the smart wheat beds, it goes from the top all the way down to the bottom. So you can have three, two, three, um, a little bit more going, going down of just nothing but biomass of, of these smart wheat beds. And you know this has to have an impact on aquatic life, the nutrient dynamics, what's going, definitely dissolved oxygen and light, what's going on out there. And so we just wanted to, to kind of get an idea. We didn't do much. Uh, again, this is just a, just a start. But we looked at just the basics that you're going to find on your, your standard YSI Pro from conductivity, dissolved oxygen, temp temperature, pH, and, and, and so on. And then just to make sure that the um, DO meter was working, we would periodically pull out a, a, do a modified Winkler titration just to make sure that the DO was accurate. Because it really a lot depends upon what's, what's happening with the dissolved oxygen out there. We didn't sample much. We had five sample events. And as you can see, I only put four of them in because I missed, I missed the one, which was my fault. But that's okay. And I, I'm going to go through these really quick. I learned two things from these. One, one, I have no idea how to use Excel. So if you were around me last <laughs> night, um, something as simple as this, as this took, took me forever. I only got one beer last night because I was trying to figure this out. So, and I didn't enjoy the posters as much. But what I really want to point out here is, is if you look at the different beds, and again, we have the beds and we have the open water channels. And we have to distinguish between the open water channel and Big Pond, which has extensive submergent beds, versus the, the channels in Long Pond, which are a little bit deeper, still have submergent beds, not as much. And then if you go, again, towards uh, the bridge in Marina Lake, it changes even more. We didn't get to a lot of that. So I just want to hit a couple quick things so I can have time for Jeanette to talk about the algae, which is much more interesting. But here you go. Here's June, and already this is the, in the smart weed bed. Your DO levels are already lower, and I should have put temperature profile here as well, but the DO is already lower than everywhere else, and it doesn't take much. So we had a maximum depth of, of um, about three and a half feet here, so we tried to get just off the bottom, but already look at these DO levels going down to, um, to very little by the time you, you get to, to the bottom. No lights getting in, in there. Uh, over here, we're not too bad. Here's your water shield, and you have a pretty, um, pretty straight profile going all, all the way down. But your new far, which is pretty extensive, is already starting to decline. Again, these are shallow. This is only three to four feet. So already in June, we're, we're running out of uh, dissolved oxygen. You jump to the end of June, and here's your smart weed bed again, and look at this. It's by three feet. There's, there's no dissolved oxygen. And again, minimal light, so I want to see what's going on with the phytoplankton, but this is going to impact in these beds nutrient dynamics, what's going on with phosphorus, for, for, for example, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But now look at the new far and look at the water shield as well. 
So once you go down a few feet, they're dropping off to, to no dissolved oxygen as, as well. So this is really kind of leading in to tell us what else do we need to do to look at as, as we go out there. I'm, I'm going to kind of pass over these, but you can kind of see as you go later into, into the season, the same thing is, is happening. Uh, but again, the, the smart weed beds consistently have lower dissolved, dissolved oxygen. And as you get into August, uh, there's very little dissolved oxygen at the surface as well. And so again, this is leading to a lot of questions about what's happening out there. Uh, I'm going to skip over, over this. Um, I didn't do much with temperature here because I, I didn't have much time, but I should have done a temperature profile. You can see the temperature across the, the board is pretty much, pretty much the same, except if we look at the, um, uh, let's see, where is my temperature for, um, I'm looking for temperature for the open water. You can see I've looked at this a lot. Um, and I don't, here we go, this one right here and the open water on top, so it, it's, as you might expect, the channels where you don't have these, these emergent beds, the water is warmer, and you would expect that. No light, you've got a lot of coverage, it's, it's colder. Um, and then if you look at DO through the year, this is just one foot below the surface, by the way, you can see consistently that the, that the smart weed had the lower dissolved oxygen. And so there's a lot of, a lot of um, plant material that's sloughing off, that's getting into the water column, potential decomposition, so it'd be really interesting to, to see what's, what's going on out there. Turbidity, pretty much the same across the board, but again, uh, the open water channel tended to have a little more because there was a lot of uh, organic debris that was in the water column as well. This is just one date, but most of the dates were, were pretty similar. And pH, and it, again, this is all basic data, but it, it starts leading into other things. Here's your smart weed again. Look at our, our, lower, our lower pH. And again, why is, that, why is that going on? Well, again, Little, very little light, um, very little photosynthesis is probably take, taking place down here, and so we're going to see a difference in pH from the other, the other beds and the open water channels as, as well. Specific conductivity, not much else going on there, um, and so we kind of come back to these, to these beds. The one area we didn't look at, this is the nearshore environment, and so you've got a fairly diver, um, diverse mix here from floating leaf, your brazinia, your, your water lilies, to your emergent plants, um, a variety of um, uh, your arrowheads, and soft stem bulrush, and some, and some others. What's going on here? Because there's at least a foot of water here as well. So we need to look at this, and then I'll come back. I'll, I'll do my obligatory um, habs. This is my five second spot for habs. But I mentioned this yesterday that I was just out at a conference in Cincinnati, and there was a lot of talk about habs and healthy submergent and emergent aquatic beds. And does that have an influence on the outbreak of, of HABs? And again, what we need to keep in mind, you talk about phosphorus in, the, in these emergent beds uh, where you have very little DO, you have a potential site to release a lot of phosphorus back in, into the water column. These shallow wetlands, large surf, sediment surface area to, uh, to water volume, a lot of potential to put phosphorus back into, into the system. So I'm not gonna, I'll skip a lot of starry stonewort out there, and you can see what it does. This is invasive, it's, it's throughout the, uh, the lagoon system now. And what impact is this having? I didn't even mention about putting the probe down into the submergent beds. So what's going on in the submergent beds? So this kind of just kicked off a, um, a lot of questions for us so we can do something, something next year. And I want, I want to know what's going on with the phytoplankton. So, go ahead. Jeez. So, that's for you. That's for you. So, go ahead. Okay. Um, all right. It's been a while. Let's see. Go to the next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Isn't it there? There. Oh, what? No, no. I haven't used this in a while. This is why she Fix brought this. Fix this, Bob. This is why she and brought this. Hurry up. We only have a couple seconds. It's <laughs> not my problem. <laughs> Okay, there you go. Um, all right, and again, going back to the algae, why is this important to monitor? And, you know, I think that we're learning, especially uh, with the cyanobacteria, that, you know, it's extremely sensitive to changes in um, nutrient and pollution loading. So, um, and with the lagoons, everybody's going in there to eat. So this really gets to be a little bit important. You know, we're spraying stuff or we're spraying vegetation. What's it doing to the algae? I've always been wondering about this and you know how it's affecting things. All right, this is the one I first. Yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, basically.
basically I broke it down into phytoplankton and, and periphyton. And so the, um, the uh, phytoplankton is the uh, water or the algae that's in the water column. Oh, I don't really cut my thing off. And um, the uh, periphyton is the algae that it's basically attaching to sticks, plants, rocks, whatever, um, <clears throat> that it finds most suitable for a substrate. Um, for the methods for the phytoplankton, I usually just use a, a, a plankton net. I have over, ah, there it is. Okay, so that's set up for open water. This gets a little bit harder to do in lagoons. Now, this is at a different marsh. Um, and this is uh, one of my uh, buddies from Cleveland, and I send him in the mucky areas for me, and this is what he's got to deal with. So it's kind of hard sometimes to use those nets. Um, for the periphyton, now this is a uh, Brasinia leaf, and um, another interesting thing too with the Brasinia is that it's really gelatinous, and it generally tends to keep things from growing on it. So um, if you have Brasinia with lots of, um, like in these little brown areas uh, the, with the diatoms, if you have a lot of diatoms on there, then that generally means you have a lot of nutrient loading going on. If you, you know, these Brasinia leaves, if you scrape them off, you're not picking up much, well then you know that your nutrients are on the low side. I have no clue what those are. I have a funny feeling I don't want to know either. That's somebody else's feeling. That's probably disgusting. Um, okay, so what did I find? The planktonic algae really kind of surprised me because it wasn't very diverse. Um, I would expect that, you know, kind of like around inside the beds when I was doing the hand grabs, um, but not with the plankton net because I had a 10 micron net and I really just expected to pick a lot more up and I wasn't. I have um, some denobrian here and a little fragile area which um, they're just so beautiful. And a little serratium, but that's it, you know. Um, no real greens, you know. It's, I mean, I just thought that was very odd. Um, but I did find cool stuff, okay. Now, right about the end of summer, you might go into the lagoons and you see these little balls, these gelatinous balls. These are colonies of uh, blue-green algae um, nostoc, and if you cut them open, that's what they look like. Some people eat those. The thunder Bob was trying to steal from me was red algae. I have been looking for this for like ever. This is like the holy grail in freshwater systems. Now, mostly this is, a, a, most of your red algae is actually marine. And that's, the marine ones are the ones that cause the issues like down in Florida with the red tides and stuff like that. So don't come away, oh my gosh, you found red algae, we're all gonna die, no. So, um, it, it's just so cool. And these are the different magnifications. This is the uh, real size. I just seen it float in there. I was like, oh my god. And then I threw it under the microscope. This is at 10 and this is at 40 times. And it's just such a neat find. And it hasn't been recorded on the park, so I was really excited about this. Um, okay. Next year, what I want to do, well, this winter, I have to go through those diatoms. All the diatoms have to be cleaned with chemicals and um, in order to I IBM, so that's gonna take a little while. Next year, getting back to the whole oxygen thing, I have been wanting to do primary production with the light and the dark bottle method. And the light bottle measures photosynthesis and respiration, dark bottle measures respiration, and using that, then you do a bunch of math, and voila, you can tell what's going on in your aquatic body. Um, I'd also like to do a little paleo stuff. Um, I've been wanting to uh, get some diatom cores from sediment, and that would also allow us to look before we started spraying and things like that. So, you know, um, to see what's going on. And of course, monitoring for the taxa. So, that's all I got. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I should have put that up there, but there's, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, actually, but, what? So, but even in like the three feet, you see it clearly. It's getting it and it's staying pretty steady throughout the whole thing. Yeah. 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 Y
throughout the summer? That, I it, that it's, it's, the strategy yes. should remain right. throughout the summer. Yeah, you can even, if, if you get into the water, you can even put your hand as you go down, you can feel it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing what that um, emergent vegetation, floating leaf and emergent vegetation can do. And is there any difference in that stratification? Like, is it stronger in that? Is it smart? Leaf? Yeah, it's, it's stronger in the smart leaf than anywhere else. And I would assume it's because the smart leaf biomass is from top to bottom. Whereas new far in the water shield, it's more on top. Now the water shield does have more of the submergent vegetation getting in there as well. But the effects of submergent vegetation are completely different than, than the emergent vegetation. But yes, it is clearly different. But it's simple stuff, but it's kind of neat to see and it leads to a lot of other things. So. Any other questions? Any questions on, phyto, on, on phytoplankton? I'm not a phytologist. <laughs> yeah? Do you have any clue what ecological role that Nostom might play in the ecosystems? Not a clue. Not a clue. I would really like to know that. <laughs> That's why we study it. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. So this is simply just to show you that there's are separate places at this point. Um, that's where we are in the world, obviously. There's a picture of French Creek there. This is a land cover map of the French Creek watershed. So you can see that it's very close to Lake Erie, but French Creek actually flows into the Allegheny River, which then flows into the Ohio River, which then flows uh, into the Mississippi River. So we're really thinking about the headwaters of the Mississippi um, for this part of the talk. When I talk about brown gobies, um, in French Creek watershed, they did come from Lake Erie um, and the surrounding tributaries, but they, they've been introduced to a new place now. Uh, French Creek is extremely important to the state of Pennsylvania because of the high degree of biodiversity that it has. So it has more fish, more mussels, um, more birds, more everything than anywhere else in the state. And so because of that high degree of biodiversity, Having this new uh, invasive species in the area is something that we are particularly concerned about. Um, so over 89 species of fish, 15 species of darter, which are small perch uh, that live in the stream systems, um, indicate really good water quality. Uh, 29 different species of freshwater mussel, and just to give you um, some comparison, the entire continent of Europe only has eight species of mussels, and in French Creek we have 29. Uh, so again, this is just sort of showing you um, how many different species are living in this area. So in terms of the history of the introduction, this is pretty new in terms of uh, the invasive species. So there's a picture of the brown goby down there on the bottom left, so you um, have an idea. It came into Lake Erie and the Great Lakes probably through ballast water of oceanic freighters in the early 1990s. So it's been in the Great Lakes and Lake Erie for a really long time. It probably was introduced to Lake LaBeouf, which is uh, an aerial photo up there that you can see. Um, and it's shown in red where that is in the French Creek watershed. Probably through bait bucket transfer, which means that people got bait to go fishing, um, probably bought bait along Lake Erie somewhere then went down to Lake LaBeouf uh, at the end of the day, dumped their bait into the water, and it had brown gobies in it. That's sort of the thought process when we think about how these things sort of jumped watersheds. Um, so that was in the summer of 2014 that they were first discovered uh, in Lake LaBeouf. Um, after that, we've sort of been monitoring the situation. Um, in 2016, they moved into the main stem of French Creek. 
So to give you sort of the lineage of how things go, Lake Lebeuf flows into the outflow, which is Lebeuf Creek. Lebeuf Creek flows into the main stem of French Creek. Um, so they did move from the lake all the way down through Lebeuf uh, Creek and then now into the main stem of French Creek. Uh, and again, that was confirmed in the summer of 2016 and we've been continuously finding them in the main stem uh, since then. So the objectives of this study um, were really to just look at how fast these things are spreading. There's a lot of literature out there that says, oh, they spread you know, this many kilometers a year, um, or it's only downstream movement, and they use all of these different mechanisms to move downstream. But brown gobies have never been introduced to an area that has such a high degree of biodiversity. Uh, so we just don't, we didn't know what to expect um, when you have so many native species sort of pushing back um, against this native. So really looking at how fast they're moving uh, through the main channel of French Creek, if they're being introduced anywhere else, so a lot of sampling other places as well. And then also looking at potential impacts to the native fauna that we have, particularly thinking about microhabitat partitioning with species that we know they compete with in other places. So those darters that I, were talking, that I was talking about um, and some other small benthic species that sort of live on the bottom of the stream. And another thing that we were looking at is diet overlap among movies and again those starters, just because we know there, in a lot of places, there's direct competition uh, among those species. So in terms of how we accomplished this, um, for the diet work, round gobies were collected through a kick stain. Um, backpack electrofishing was used to sort of just see presence absence, but when we were doing diet analysis, um, it's nice if the fish don't throw their food up when you shock them. So we would use a seine for that. Um, stomachs were removed after the fish was preserved. All of the stomach contents would be identified to the lowest possible taxa. Um, a lot of times it was only to family, try to get to genus uh, when possible. And then for the microhabitat work, snorkeling um, is how we conducted that research. So when we snorkel, that's a picture of, uh, of me and a, a colleague, Jay, in LaBeouf Creek. Um, essentially what we were looking at is water depth, water velocity, how far a fish is from the bank. So if all the fish are found right along um, the bank or are they in the middle of the channel, um, those types of things. Uh, if they were above or below a cover object because many fish like to hide um, under rocks. And then the position in the stream. So were they facing upstream, were they facing downstream to the left, to the right, that type of thing. Um, so it gives you a whole lot of information, um, but it is very time consuming. So this is just sort of to give you an example of what our sites would look like. So we would have two people snorkeling normally at the bottom moving up. Every time we saw a fish, a benthic fish uh, in the stream, we would put a numbered flag in. Um, I would write down underwater what species that is, and then we would have uh, Again, I would write down what way it was facing the water column and whether it was above or below cover. And then I would have a crew come in behind me um, afterwards so that they didn't scare any fish um, and take all those abiotic factors. So the water velocity, water depth, substrate analysis, all of that stuff. And so our sites started looking a lot like this, where you have transects set up, usually 50 meters is what we would snorkel, and every single one of those orange flags is where I saw a fish. So these are like 12, 14 hour days uh, in the field, which are it's really long and time consuming. But again, it gives you so much information and it tells you so much about what's happening in the stream. And so essentially we would have sites where there were no round gobies um, in French Creek and then we would go to places where there were round gobies. So we could sort of directly compare the same fish in the same system um, in the presence of this invasive species and then without invasive species. So in terms of results, um, the current invasion front is about 600 meters downstream of where Lebeuf Creek flows into French Creek. So it's just coming into French Creek. Um, and that was the last sample that I did was September of 2018. So that's um, pretty current. Um, you can see the little inlay map uh, at the top there. Um, and again, it just shows you all through Lebeuf Lake uh, round gobies are there to the inflow of the lake themselves uh, and then in the outflow as well. 
And then, you know, they're starting to move downstream. In terms of stomach contents, one of the things that when we first found round gobies in French Creek, there was a task force developed, and all the people that were on that task force, um, the idea that round gobies may be eating freshwater mussels came up. Um, they eat zebra and quag mussels in Lake Erie. That's their natural food. It just happened to be that zebra mussels were here when they were also introduced, and so their native food was here, and they had plenty to eat, and their populations exploded. Um, a lot of times, round gobies that live in stream systems just eat aquatic macroinvertebrates because there's not mussels available. French Creek is a little different because there are so many native freshwater mussels. Those mussels are big, though, and so we didn't think that they'd be eating the big ones, but we didn't know if they would be eating the small ones. Uh, and it turns out that they are. So uh, that is just all individual tiny little mussels from just one round goby. Um, there was one that I cut open, and the fish was probably this big, and it had 170 um, mussels in just the stomach contents. So they are eating freshwater mussels, which is a, a new discovery. And then they're also eating um, fingernail clams, uh, which are a little bit bigger. So this is a table of the stomach contents. Um, Obviously, there's a lot more stuff that they're eating, and if you're interested in hearing about that, I can tell you that or show you that table at the end. I attached it in case anybody wanted to see it. But these are the three highest percentages of what they're eating. Um, they're broken into size classes because as gobies get bigger, they have bigger mouths and they can consume bigger food. So size class one was 37 or millimeters to 44 is really hard to dissect a fish and look at its stomach contents when it's smaller than 30 millimeters so that was sort of the cutoff there are smaller ones that i have preserved but you just can't cut them open and see anything um, size class two you can see size class three and then size class four greater than 75 millimeters so you see that we have all age classes um, that were also found in the stream itself and if you look closely, you can see in size class one, freshwater mussels, um, which are unionidae, at 71% um, of their stomach contents are freshwater mussels, which is crazy. Um, as you move through the size classes, you can see that um, fingernail clams, the sophirids, um, go up in the largest size class, and it's probably because they have a, a larger gape bigger mouth, they can consume bigger prey items. Um, and so it's interesting that it shifts from freshwater mussels to, to fingernail clams based on the size of the fish. Um, they're also eating in a really high percentage kiranomids, which is not surprising. Pretty much every um, insectivore fish uh, in the stream is eating those. They're abundant, um, they're really easy to eat, they're easy to find, they're easy to handle. Um, so all the darters eat kiranomids, round gobies eat kiranomids, it's not surprising. In terms of the microhabitat partitioning, um, these are some principal components analysis that was done on the data. And so essentially, um, every all those abiotic factors that we looked at, water velocity and water depth were the two main principal components. So it always seemed that water velocity really dictated where these fish were found. Didn't matter if they were above or below a cover object, didn't really matter how far from the bank they were. Um, water velocity seemed to be the one factor that stood out every way that we analyzed this information. So this is sort of busy, but I do um, want you to look particularly at that dark purple color, um, which is the banded darter, so Ethiostoma zonali. Um, they're considered generalists as far as darters go. They can live in a wide range of habitats. Um, you know, they eat a lot of kiranomids, which are found pretty much everywhere. Um, and they're a top competitor when it comes to a darter. They, they can stick around a lot longer than other ones can. And you can see that polygon that it makes is sort of round. Um, and this is particularly showing that they can live in slow moving water and fast moving water. When you look at the same species in the presence of gobies, which is the right hand figure here, um, Ethiostoma zonali, The middle one. Okay, so <laughs> Ethiostoma zonali's uh, polygon now shifted to really, really, really narrow. 
um, in the presence of gobies. And so they've sort of been pushed into having a very particular place that they can live um, in terms of water velocity. So this is the round goby here. And you can see that, um, again, it's sort of living in a wide range of places. Um, but that's the one that is really interesting because they are considered a generalist and now they're sort of being pushed into this narrow habitat. It was um, pretty surprising to see that all of the darters, uh, Zomali was the one that really stood out. They are reproducing in French Creek, so I have found nests of round gobies in the stream and I have found males protecting those nests. Um, so we do know that they're actively reproducing. I found them in May reproducing, July reproducing. Um, August is the last time that I've seen them, but it's thought that they can reproduce all the way until October. Um, but we do have confirmation that they are building nests and protecting those. Further movement downstream, um, there was somebody that contacted me in 2015 who works for the Western um, Conservancy. And he uh, actually is a mussel biologist and just happened to be snorkeling at his property on French Creek. Took a picture of this fish and sent it to me and it is uh, around Gobi. And so this would be the most southern occurrence. Um, it's about a mile downstream from where I found them. Um, I went there a couple of times and I never got any Gobi so it may have just washed down um, as one individual but there doesn't seem to be a population there at this point. The other thing um, is that this property where he took this picture is very close to Cambridge Springs, if any of you are from this area. And round gobies do like deeper, slower moving water that sort of acts like a lake. And um, Cambridge Springs, where French Creek flows right there, is about 12, 15 feet deep. And so it's, if they do move down that far, uh, that's probably going to be a place where they're going to have really high numbers. Um, and that just happens to be right upstream of where we get some of the highest biodiversity in the stream itself. So we get um, just downstream of this location, you can get 15, 13 species of darters within 100 meters, which is just insane. And 18 different species of mussels all in one area. Um, and so it's a little bit um, disheartening to, to think about that. Future projects, so this is stuff that we've started. Um, obviously, the long-term goals for me are just to continue to monitor the situation and see what's happening. Um, looking at rates of dispersal, how they're dispersing, determining habitat shifts, diet shifts with our native species. Um, mussel bed surveys have been conducted at this point, so floating the whole stream, getting out, snorkeling, um, identifying mussels for mark recapture as well, so that's a, um, pictures of some mussels that we marked last summer and then we went back to see how many were there this summer. Um, new research has also been funded through 2020 to look at genetic analysis on the stomach contents and that's really to identify what freshwater mussels they're eating. Um, obviously when you're looking at them under a microscope you can't tell which species of mussel there are so we have to do genetics on it to be able to figure that out which is why we did the mussel bed survey. So we went through, we took some tissue samples of all the different species. Um, sent that to USGS, it's obviously in GenBank now, and so now we can compare the stomach contents to the mussels that are in the area. Another project that I have a student working on right now and I've worked on a little bit in the past is just seeing whether or not they are expanding range through larval um, drift. They are for sure doing it in Elk Creek and some of the other, other tributaries of French Creek because I've found them doing it, um, drifting at night. So essentially the larvae come out of the substrate at night and they drift downstream when there's less uh, predators around and it's a little bit safer for them to move. Um, what's really interesting is that Labuff Creek is here and then this is downstream, the water's flowing this way. There are round gobies all down through here, there are no round gobies anywhere up here or upstream at all. And so right now it seems as though they're just sort of taking the path of least resistance and they're not trying to swim upstream for range expansion, they just keep flowing down. Um, and so I'm thinking that they're probably in some cases using larval drift um, to accomplish some range expansion as well. So in conclusion, round gobies have moved into the main stem of French Creek. They're expected to continue moving downstream. Um, I don't see why they wouldn't or what's going to stop them. 
Um, they are eating native freshwater mussels, so we're now looking into which species of mussels they're eating. And then they do have habitat variables which overlap with our native darters. Ethiostomus nali or the banded darter is the one that really sticks out um, as is interesting to me because they're considered a generalist. Um, all right, and with that, I will take any questions. So the, the banded darter petitioning is that's that's interesting. Is anybody looking at like population level genetics in that in that banded darter um, uh, community to see if the the reduction from a generalist to a very specific uh, yeah. partition is shifting the nobody's darter? looking at it, no. but that's a really good project that I'm going to store right here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Trying to decide how to ask this just like, um, if you know what their habitats are like in Europe and then uh, combine that with what you said about the deep water Cambridge, it strikes me that high flow riffle uh, habitats might be least likely for they are to be established. Is that a good, that's good news, would you say? I would say that that's good news because that's where most of our darters are. So, I mean, one way to maybe mitigate this is to make more riffles in a stream. Where they are right now, um, the invasion front, there is a huge riffle, and we don't find them below that. So they're sort of sitting in this pool right above this riffle, and they're not moving downstream, and they've been pretty much in the same spot for two years now without, without moving too much further. Um, they just don't like that really fast-moving habitat. They're used to being in lakes. Um, so it's interesting to think about um, but darters, for the most part, many of them like that faster moving water and gobies sort of like cobbly, gravelly bottom in slower moving water. But there is going to be some overlap with Johnny darters and with greenside darters, some uh, zone banded darters working on my common names. But yes. So if they got the big rivers, the big river darters would be? Yes, like channel darters. Channel darters. Channel. Yeah. yeah. Log perch, too. I mean, yeah. I was wondering what else they eat. So they eat a whole slew of things. <laughs> These are all the different aquatic insects that they eat. Um, mostly mayflies, um, some stoneflies, and they do eat caddisflies too. And then there's a couple little things that they eat. But for the most part, mayflies and caddisflies um, are a big part of their diet. Good question. Yes, Jim. Casey, any essence of hydration science? Um, I mean, the, the population in LaBeouf Creek is growing of round gobies for sure. In French Creek, we're finding, it's, it's interesting, I'm not finding a lot of small ones, I'm finding big gross ones. So I don't know what they're doing. I just find really big ones, and this is seining, electrofishing, snorkeling, I mean everything that I can think of to try to find them. And in the main stem of French Creek, I'm finding big ones. Um, in LaBeouf Creek, I'm finding smaller ones. So I don't know what they're up to. Yeah. Yes? I was just wondering, um, the unionids in the smoke content yep. um, were primarily in that small size class? Yes. Is there a timing issue when the unionids are putting out their young that are that size and the gobi, you know, when we're finding them in the batch of, of fish? It, 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 is there a chance that some of the unionids are going to be reproducing in times when there are not gobies in that, that size class? The problem is that gobies are reproducing once a month. Um, and so they're just and they have so many young at one time. Um, and the mussels, for the most part, I don't know everything there is to know about mussel biology, but I do see the mussels displaying their mantles when I'm snorkeling, usually in July, um, which is when we get the highest reproduction rate of brown gobies, too. So, yeah. If, uh, if you have a host yeah, they do serve as a host for mucket. They do, and actually Jay Stolfer um, is, is doing some work with um, mussels and round gobies right now at Penn State in those artificial stream tanks that used to be here. 
Um, so he's got a whole bunch of mussels from fish and wildlife, all different species, um, and he's trying to figure out if they can serve as a host for some of those, which is pretty cool. Um, so maybe they won't, maybe they'll eat them, but they'll also serve as a host for some of them too. It's hard to say what the impact's gonna be. Okay, We're ready for the next one. In the back, can you hear me? Good. Again, I'm Sean Rafferty with the Pennsylvania Sea Grant College Program. For those of you in the room that aren't familiar with our program, we're one of 33 programs around the nation administered through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And what we focus on is promoting the ecological and economic sustainability of our coastal resources. And we have three pillars. So we do that through science-based research, extension, and education. The Pennsylvania program is a collaboration between the Penn State University, NOAA, and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I'll put a couple plugs in here. One of my hats with research is, with Sea Grant is directing their research program. So as part of our mandate from Congress, we're required to fund competitive research on a biennial schedule. So I wanna let uh, the researchers in the room know that we are gonna be releasing our next request for proposals coming in January or February this year. So if you're interested in getting on our announcement list, sir, please see me after the meeting or send me an email so I can get that information to you. Another one of my hats is I'm an actual researcher. I've become more of a desk biologist of late, but that kind of happens sometimes. So today I'm gonna talk about a project I just completed over the past year, and it's looking at the prevalence of intersects and fishes collected at Presque Isle Bay and Long Point Bay, Ontario. Yes? Yeah. What is, what is the micro? Micropters dolomew. Yeah, so originally, when I was putting this presentation together, I was going to specifically talk about smallmouth bass. And I apologize to the fisheries biologists in the room, but I'm going to use common names if that's okay. Do you prefer that? I don't know. I was just Okay, yeah, so specifically, I was going to talk about one species, but I actually looked at multiple species. So we'll discuss four different species. Thank you for that question. Okay, so what I plan on doing is providing an introduction, so kind of the background, the genesis of the project. My research questions or question, uh, provide a brief background on intersects and gonochoristic fishes. So gonochoristic fishes are either, they're fishes that are uh, genetically male or female. This is an opposed to hermaphroditic fish that can be both male or female. I'll also discuss the methods, so our sampling sites, how we process the fish, Histopathology, so histopathology is the study of microscopic changes in tissue as a result of disease. So you look at tissue under a microscope to see how it's affected by disease. And then I'll briefly, briefly mention data analysis. I hope there's no statisticians in the room. Uh, also we'll briefly discuss the results and have a discussion on what these results may or may not mean. So a little background, in 1972, the United States and Canadian governments entered into the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And what this did was commit both countries to maintaining the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the Great Lakes. This was in response to cultural eutrophication happening in Lake Erie as a response of phosphorus. In 1978, this was again amended to deal with toxic substances. And later, the agreement was amended in 1987, and what it did was create the Great Lakes Area Concern Program. Originally, in 87, there was 42 essentially toxic hotspots identified around the Great Lakes, and these could have had any of one of 14 impairments. Presque Isle Bay was later listed in 1991, specifically because of contaminated sediments and tumors in our brown bullhead catfish. Uh, after some research in 2002, the AOC actually became the first American AOC to be listed in the recovering stage. So this meant no remediation was needed, just continued monitoring. In 2007, that sediment issue was removed from the area of concern, and then more recently in 2013, the AOC was delisted. So a couple questions. 
came up after the delisting. So was the use of liver and ex external tumors in brown bullhead um, appropriate as indicators of ecosystem health? So a couple of questions of my research were, are the prevalence of liver and external tumors in brown bullhead indicative of a healthy bay? Do other fishes in Presque Isle Bay have liver and external tumors? Unfortunately, I'm not talking about tumors today, so I hate to disappoint. What I'm going to focus on is, are there other indicators that could be used to evaluate the ecosystem health of Presque Isle Bay? So specifically, I looked at something we call intersex. So intersex is the presence of both male and female characteristics in an individual fish. So this would include immature oocytes in the testes of male fish. Or what we see sometimes is sperm within the female gonad or the ovaries of fish. Um, a recent publication by Bahamidi et al. 2013, or is it, yeah, 2013 identified 37 fishes from 17 families that have uh, intersex. Specifically, they looked at ova testes, so that's the presence of these immature egg cells in the testes of fish. So some of the fishes are roach, so that's a river fish from the United Kingdom, it's been heavily studied in Europe, particularly associated with wastewater treatment. Uh, white sucker, that's a common fish we find in our area. Rainbow darters, we also find in our area. Largemouth bass, uh, <clears throat> even brown bullhead, intersex has been observed in these fish. And then for smallmouth bass, the first report I saw in the literature was from 1995, a study looking at the Mississippi River. Um, the first instance of intersex in fish goes back to the 1930s um, in an aquarium fish where the ova testes were observed in an aquarium fish from Africa, I believe. So what's driving intersex or what do we think may be driving intersex? Um, so it's most often associated to endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment. So these normal hormone, hormones attach the receptors in the cell and then they drive processes, ex gene expression, uh, to produce either eggs or sperm. Um, however, there are chemicals in the environment that can mimic natural estrogen, but there's also hormones that block those receptors that don't allow, those genetic ex allow that genetic expression to occur. Um, so there's a whole host, there's been thousands of chemicals that have been suggested as estrogenic compounds, these can be natural or anthropogenic, so you have natural estrogens in the environment. We also have synthetic estrogens from contraceptives, uh, pesticides, metals, polychlorinated biphenyls, flame, flame retardants, which are PBDEs, and then also some of the pharmaceuticals that we're seeing, Joe talked about yesterday, we're starting to see in the environment, plasticizers, things like bisphenol A you may have heard of. Uh, so there's really two thoughts of when the exposure or when intersex can be driven. So it's either something happens during early development that manifests later in life, or is it that they're exposed at a young age that makes them more susceptible when they're re-exposed as adults? Uh, the science is unclear there, so I think there's a lot of work in determining that. What we do know from the literature, though, is the larval stages seem to be sensitive. So Japanese Madaka exposed to aquaphenol. This is used to produce surfactants. Uh, developed intersex. So this is a laboratory study where they are exposed to a chemical and then they had non-chemical exposure. Uh, this study here in Madaka exposed to 17 beta estradiol. Um, again, these fishes developed intersex. And then there was also intersex observed in male roach exposed to wastewater effluent. So there is evidence that EDCs can drive intersex in fishes. So the sampling sites, so we looked at Presque Isle Bay, some of my colleagues earlier uh, went into great detail describing the bay. Um, I also looked at Long Point Bay, and this has traditionally been used as a reference site for Presque Isle Bay. So Dr. Grazio and myself in the 2000s did our lake-wide Lake Erie tour, sampling brown bullhead from a, around the Great Lakes, and then we worked with our statistician to identify this as the most appropriate reference site for looking at tumors. So I did that for intersex as well. So the target was 30 sexually mature individuals uh, per site per year. So I analyzed Presque Isle Bay in 2013, 14, and 15. I also looked at Long Point Bay in 2014 and 2015. 
and a variety of methods were used to capture fish. We used boat electrofishing, primarily in Presque Isle Bay, and then hoop nets, so we worked with a commercial fishery in Canada where we purchased fish from them, and then also worked with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, and they set gill nets for us. Uh, morpholog morphological measurements, so we did total length and weight on the fishes, then performed necropsy. So all fish were anesthetized using MS-222, and then we euthanized them with an overdose of that MS-222. At that point, the gonads were removed, weighed the, the gonads when appropriate, and preserved in 10% formalin. And then we also removed the otoliths. So that's how we, ate, we can age fish. Um, it's a bone within the, the I guess, the hearing system, the auditory system with, within the head. And you can actually count rings on the otolith, so it's kind of like aging a tree. Or there's people that can do that. I did not do that part. So the histopathology, I actually did the histopathology. Um, so a lot of the, the prep work was performed at the U.S. Geological Survey's Fish Health Lab in West Virginia. And so of each gonad, we took five to ten cross sections. It's embedded in paraffin, which is a wax. And then you can slice um, those paraffin blocks and thin slices about six microns um, thick. Those are then stained with hematoxylin and eosin. So the hematoxylin stains the nucleus or the acidic environment of the cell. And then the eosin is used to stain the, the cytoplasm or the basic environment of the cell. And the hematoxylin I'll show you in the next slide appears purple. And the eosin is a pink stain. I then used Blazer 2002 for the diagnosis of intersex. For this study, I specifically looked at the presence or absence of intersex. Um, a lot of literature now is looking at actual severity, so the number of egg cells you see in a testes, there's, there's a scale from zero to five, or one to five. The data analysis, I used a logistic regression analysis, so this is used for looking at binomial data, again, the absence, presence. Uh, my covariates were location, year, age, and length. You'll notice weight's not included. Unfortunately, on some of the collections in Canada, we were on a vessel, and I just wasn't able to weigh um, the fish or the gonads on board the vessel. I used the AIC uh, to determine which, fit the data, which model fit the data best. So this is looking at the goodness of fit, but it also penalizes your model for the number of parameters you add. And then I used two keys, multi-comparison, to identify which locations and years uh, had significant differences. So this is, um, when you're doing histopathology, this is what you're looking at under a microscope. This is 10 time magnification. On the left side here, so figure A is a normal testes. Um, so you see the sperm within the seminiferous tubules. Over here on the right hand side, what you're looking at is, a, is looking at is ovotestes. Um, so this is an intersex gonad. So you have your uh, normal sperm cells, but then in the epithelial of these tubules, you start seeing these immature egg cells. So results. So again, I mentioned I looked at brown bullhead, yellow bullhead, bowfin, those are benthic fishes, and I also looked at uh, smallmouth bass, which is a pelagic fish. And so what I found was none of the, the benthic fish had intersex testes. So 0% of all the fishes I looked at. And this data only looks at the male fish. So I, the females, we didn't see intersex, and so I'm only looking at the ova testes, or the immature egg cells within the male gonad. But what we can see is in the smallmouth basses, we observed intersex at every site and every year we sampled. So overall, in the three-year study, Long Point Bay had an intersex prevalence of about 45%, and then Presque Isle Bay had a prevalence of 72%. So this is just looking at the raw data. There's no statistics involved. So we ran our logistic regression model and found that location and year were significant factors. So the probability of a fish um, having a tumor in each of these years and location are presented in this table. And what these letters here indicate is which sites and years are significantly different. So those sites with different letters are significantly different from one another. So what we see actually is 2013 Presque Isle Bay, we had a prevalence of about 92%. And that was significantly different from Long Point Bay in each year. Um, however, it wasn't significantly different from Presque Isle Bay in 2014. So it seems that Presque Isle Bay is a little higher. 
What you can see is also the sample sizes that are a little, a little bit different. So what you get when you have a lower sample size is you have these much wider confidence intervals. So what does it mean? Uh, what does intersex and smallmouth bass mean? What is driving it? What's causing? As we know in field studies, it's almost impossible to show causation, very difficult. But what you can do is start building a body of evidence. So where are we seeing intersex occur? What types of environments? So Blazer et al. 2017 looked at the relationship between agriculture intensity and human populations and its influence on intersex. So I apologize for all the information up here. These slides were used to defend my dissertation, so I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything while I was defending. But essentially what I have is the sites up here, and then the parentheses, that represents the prevalence of intersex at that site. So they looked at sites within the Chesapeake Bay drainage, and what they essentially found was as human population and agriculture intensity increased, so did the prevalence of intersex. Um, so what we see in Presque Isle Bay, we're about 55% urban here, whereas Long Point Bay is 75% agriculture. So you have really two different environments, um, one ag heavy, one urban heavy, but we still see intersex in both environments. They also deployed semi permeable membrane devices and polar organic compound integrated samplers. And these are essentially put on the environment and they, they're supposed to mimic what a fish may be exposed to over a period of time. And unfortunately they didn't look at natural synthetic estrogens in the, five minutes, uh, in the analysis but they did detect a, a number of endocrine disrupting compounds in their sample. And my colleague Jim Grazi in 2013, as the study was beginning, deployed uh, these same devices in Presque Isle Bay and Long Point Bay. We're still waiting on some of those data to come through, but we do have some. And I looked through it briefly, and a lot of EECs are detected in both, both uh, systems. Urban areas, so Blazer et al. 2018 recently looked at intersex prevalence in Great Lakes areas of concern. Um, and what they looked at is not just the prevalence, but they looked at the expression of genes actually. So getting at what may be driving this intersex. So they did find a positive relationship between the prevalence of intersex and gene expression that's associated with estrogenic compounds. Interesting they found as well as negative correlations between intersex prevalence and two androgen receptors. So this suggests anti-androgen activity occurring as well. Varying land uses. So again, the Chesapeake Bay drainage, and what I want to point out here is the Gauley River had a prevalence of about 11% intersex and is 95% forested. So it's not urban, it's not ag. Whereas Conococci Creek, I probably pronounced that wrong, uh, about half, 50% agriculture, and it had the highest intersex prevalence, 87%. Again, um, those samplers were deployed there. But something that was analyzed there is estimated estradiol equivalents. So essentially, there's a yeast, a yeast that's been genetically modified to include an estrogen receptor on it. And so when you expose it to water with estrogens, this gene lights up. And you can measure the intensity of that signal. And it gives you an idea of how estrogenic the water is. So what they found generally as the EEQs increased, so did the prevalence of intersex. And again, we saw a similar trend in Presque Isle Bay and Long Point Bay. We had higher EEQ values in Presque Isle Bay compared to Long Point. Wastewater, so this has been uh, heavily studied in the Roach from the United Kingdom. There's been relationships established between uh, wastewater exposure and intersex in those fishes. However, my colleagues, I want to it at all in 2009, they looked at sites upstream and downstream of wastewater effluent. What they found, there was no significant differences in the populations of smallmouth bass above and below uh, the treatment effluent. Um, again, they deployed these devices. Devices seems pretty popular to deploy these for measuring water quality. They didn't detect any hormones, but they found was atrazine was very high, which is an herbicide used to treat weeds. Um, again, atrazine was higher at Long Point Bay compared to Presque Isle Bay. So what does this mean? Who cares, right? So these fish, the males have egg cells growing within their testes. Does it matter? Two minutes. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So does it have the potential to impact smallmouth populations? I think that's an important question. 
Um, in our area, smallmouth bass fishery is an important economic driver. It's not just importantly ecologically, but economically as well. Um, there is evidence in the literature of population crashes in fishes exposed to estrogenic compounds. Uh, Zebrafish exposed to synthetic estrogen. Um, we can see there was a complete population failure with no fertilization, fertilization occurring in the F1 generation. Again, fathead minnow exposed to uh, synthetic estrogen. And this was done in experimental ponds over seven years. What they found after seven years were intersex males and a near extinction of the fathead minnow. However, um, when we look at smallmouth bass, recent research tells us actually smallmouth bass in populations, the densities are actually higher in some of these impacted urban environments compared to reference sites. So again, I think we need more science there. And then the question comes up is, are these fish just susceptible? So we've discussed this over the years about the brown bullhead being our canary in the coal mine for the tumor issue. And so we're kind of using the smallmouth bass in the same respect that there are canary in the coal mine for intersex. But could it just be they're just genetically susceptible? Um, so I looked at background prevalence. What is the background rate of intersex in these fish? And it actually varies. So there's literature that shows 0%. So populations that have no intersex bass. Um, in the Gully River, we discussed earlier, around 11% of those fish in that population were intersex. And then in a number of sites in the Ohio River drainage, the percentage was about 10 to 14%. And again, another study looking at the Mississippi River in Minnesota was around 14%. So there's populations kind of around the country where the incidence is somewhat lower. So I'm thinking maybe the background rate is somewhere around 14% or less. Um, high, the high prevalence, likely not due to a natural uh, phenomenon. But again, the, the science isn't there yet. And so that's what I have today. I do want to give a couple of acknowledgments. Um, my former mentor and supervisor, Dr. Robert Light, um, he was instrumental in this, actually in my career, but this project as well. My dissertation committee, who read and reviewed 200 pages of fish go nad introduction and methods and <laughs> exciting stuff, right, Jeanette? And an hour and a half presentation and two hours of questions. Uh, my colleagues, Tom Sturmack and Sarah Stallman with the Sea Grant program, um, especially Tom, he was with me the whole way. We would leave Erie at three in the morning, drive to Canada, sample fish, drive back at eight o'clock at night. So he was a trooper. All I had to do was like feed him McDonald's. It was great. Uh, Kurt Oldenburg, Dixie Greenwood, Gordon Ives, Duncan Nori, and Tina Weir Werner, they're all with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. Great people. Um, very helpful in the studies, letting us use their vessels, their labs, their equipment. It was kind of mind blowing. Um, and then my colleagues at the United States Geological Survey, and of course our funders. So the first year of the project was funded through the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, through the uh, GLRI State Capacity Funding that the DEP manages, Penn State University, the Sea Grant Co College Program. And I'm probably out of time, but just a, another plug. I'll be discussing the same issue. Um, as part of the Northwest PA chapter of Sigma Xi, Thursday, November 29th at 6 p.m. at Calamari Squid Row. So it might be a, actually a more interesting conversation. <laughs> and right. it, oh, again, if you want to get on a research list, we have our RFP coming out. Please contact me. Thank you. Did it wasn't in the benthic fishes could at first glance be surprising because we think of these things as being a lot of these hydrophobic things being stuck in the sediment. Mm -hmm. Does that does it does, does it being in the smallmouth bass suggest that it's bioaccumulating, it's getting an extra an extra trophic transfer? Yeah, that's an interesting question. We're actually looking at that now. So I'm working with a with a chemist from Penn State University, Frank Dorman. He's an analytical chemist, and he's looking at concentrations of these compounds in the tissue of, of smallmouth bass. So I don't, I don't know if that's the case or not, or you know maybe these fish are just as genetically susceptible, and that's being looked at as well. Yes, Jim. Sean, do you think, um, do you think temperature, set determination, or sex differentiation play a role in these permits? It could. We know it plays a role in determination. I, 
I just don't know if it is or not, but it, but it definitely plays a role. It's, it's really interesting from what you said. There's, there's a whole lot of correlation. There's a lot of evidence suggesting, but it's, it seems like something that's going to correlate. Yeah, we know correlation is not causation, right? <laughs> but a lot of the stuff's going molecular and genetic expression. I think that'll, that'll really clue us in on what's happening at the genetic level. Um, John, did you, did you guys add, do measurements of like total estrogenicity of the water around Prescott? Do, is that data that you collected while you're doing the study? Yeah, so that's so. Yeah, that's data, data that Jim collected, oh. and we uh, the USGS did the analysis though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. We're still waiting on some analysis. Is this on? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Our next talk is by Dr. Schnars, our fearless leader here for the um, symposium. And she is um, giving a talk about acute decom um, decompression sickness in the Yellow Perch. Thank you. And thank you to all of you that attended the symposium throughout the last couple days and sessions. Um, so I'm going to discuss a project that we worked on for a couple seasons and um, kind of some uh, preliminary evidence of what we think is going on. So obviously we're based here at the consortium. Um, the yellow perch is a fishery that's significant to recreational and commercial fisheries in the jurisdiction of Lake Erie and stocks are sustained through natural reproduction. So there's no hatcheries for yellow perch, but instead they um, reproduce naturally in the environment, and that makes them a very important um, fishery to, to our lake. They're managed through a quota allocation, and so the Fish and Boat Commission are able to do annual sampling, determine what the population is, and then determine what the quota or the fishing limit should be um, each year for anglers. And so they use what's called a VPA or virtual population analysis. So they take these estimates and put it into a modeling system and calculate what it, you know, the population is for our region of the lake. Okay, so the problem is to examine the sources of catch and release mortality that decrease the accuracy of these um, modeling estimates, the virtual population analysis. And so the idea is when you model something, and we've talked a lot about different models over the last two days, when you model something, your output is only as good as your input. So a lot of models have assumptions, and sometimes we recognize those assumptions are being violated. And one of the assumptions with this VPA is that it is assumed um, that all of those perch that anglers catch and then release back into the environment, the assumption is um, for the model that 100% of them live. And so what we wanted to investigate is what is the mortality rate of these released perch? Can we put a number on it? And if we can, then possibly Fish and Boat Commission can integrate this into their modeling, making the models more accurate or, or better. So we looked at a couple things. We looked at hook wounding, avian predation, physiological stress, and then barotrauma or acute decompression sickness. So a couple of our objectives, we wanted to quantify differential mortality of yellow perch based on season and the depth at which they are caught by open anglers. We wanted to determine if there was a latent mortality of caught and released fish, and if that was related at all to the sex of the fish, size, um, or age. And then we also wanted to determine the size, age, and sex of yellow perch caught on charter boats or head boats that we have here. So those are the boats that take out a large group of um, people just to go fishing for the day. And we just wanted to kind of touch on that information a little bit. And then any recommendations for catch and release methods for anglers. So we needed to catch fish, um, and we needed to catch a lot of fish in a short period of time. So we went to the experts, and these guys here, if you don't know who they are, and I'm not seeing Jerry, but they are uh, the sons of Lake Erie, and so those sons save our native species, and these guys are the experts in catching fish. And we did, so um, thanks to Gannon University, we were able to use the Environaut to take out the sons, and um, we, we got out there, we caught fish in a short period of time, and we netted those fish back onto the RSC boat, 
and myself and Morris um, are there processing the fish. So those fish go into a five gallon bucket, we start taking some data on them and getting ready to release them. So the first thing we wanted to look at was hooking mortalities. Um, we, the first season that we conducted this study, we caught almost 200 fish. 28% resulted in hooking mortalities. And a hooking mortality means that the fish either swallowed the hook, or it was injured during the hook removal, um, or it had drastic uh, stress due to the ascent. So they would not be useful to um, use further in the project. So we just termed that 28%. Um, that's kind of where the, the study ended for them, and we did not use them any further. So looking at hooking mortality by month, just seeing if there was um, any trend or any relationship there, we sampled in May through September, and we looked at the percent mortality, and it really kind of varied, so we did not see, um, you know, too many trends in terms of you know, early on or late, but we did see in May and August, um, there was hooking mortality that was more significant, so our p-value was less than 0.05, so possibly during those times of the season, maybe hooking mortality could be more prevalent. Looking at hooking mortalities by depth, so did it matter how deep we were fishing? And you'll notice on the x-axis is water depth, and it's not evenly um, along the way, but these were on those days we were at 40 feet, 45 feet, 59 feet, 60 feet. So in those categories, um, what was the percent mortality? And early, or in the um, in the shallower shallower waters, 40 to 50 feet, we saw hooking mortality, and then a little bit deeper, we just did not see that trend. So um, possibly some significance there as well. In hooking mortality by sex, was there a difference if it was a male or a female? And we did not see any difference. Um, males and females had kind of equivalent hooking mortalities. Um, so, and then the um, NA, we just, that fish, um, we did not get a chance to necropsy in the lab. And then did it matter, um, we did not age these fish, but instead we put them into size categories. So did it matter the length of the fish? Um, whether there was hooking mortality or no hooking mortality. Uh, again, we did not see a difference here in the lengths of the fish, so um, that was probably not a factor in hooking mortality. And then we just combined some of the data looking at the mortality by length and date. Um, you will see on the x-axis the date and the length of the y-axis. The no hooking mortality, so the fish that um, we were able to use further in the study, are the red triangles. The blue circles are the hooking mortality. We did see at the end of the season, kind of um, the no hooking mortality was a little more prevalent there. Um, but just, you know, no, no real trends in, in the data when combining those. Okay, so we're going to move on and look at those fish. Um, separating out the hooking mortality, the other ones that were not and were able to use further, we were able to um, kind of evaluate them once we got them on the boat. And these are all symptoms that you would see of barotrauma. So think about um, if you were a scuba diver and you went down 100 feet. As you come back up, you have to do decompression stops. So think of a fish that is 40, 50, 60 feet underwater and you're bringing it up on a hook relatively quickly, you're alleviating that pressure of all the water on the fish, and as you're relieving that pressure, the swim bladder starts to expand, and as the swim, because there's air in there, so as that expands, it is pushing on the stomach. Um, in this case, for yellow perch, it pushes on the stomach. So this photo right here is the stomach actually protruding out of the mouth, and other symptoms can include the bulging eye right there, so it's uh, receiving pressure behind the eye, which makes it kind of pop out a little bit. If we look at the fin right here, you'll see some hemorrhaging right along that area. And so when we have these fish and we put them in a five gallon bucket, they're all kind of belly up. Um, they don't look very good. They're definitely going through some type of stress. And so looking at that, most anglers or researchers or any um, observers would say, you know, those, those fish are almost dead, so probably um, it's not going to work out well for them in the future. Oh, I went the wrong way, sorry. 
So then we started looking at barotrauma um, by depth, and we only have a small range of 40 to 60 feet. We would have liked to see it shallower, so um, early in the season, in April, or even earlier, the yellow perch are maybe at like 20 feet. Um, however, they move very quickly from 20 feet to 40 feet. And so um, it's difficult here because when you have to do boat work, the boats usually go in in mid to late May. And so these fish have already moved out to 40 feet by then. So unfortunately, as, that's as shallow as we could go in this study was 40 feet. And then as the summer progresses, the water temperatures warm up and these fish move out into deeper waters. So we have reported them, anglers catching them at 60, even almost 70 feet later in the season, so August, September, even into October. So when we look at best craft, we're looking at the water depth in the different categories along the x-axis, and then the percent of no barotrauma fish, so how many fish are not exhibiting any of those symptoms of barotrauma, and between that range of 40 to um, 60 feet, we are not really seeing any significant difference in terms of water depth. Um, although it would be assumed that the deeper you get, you know, and you pull these fish up, that they're going to experience barotrauma more significantly. However, this could be because we have a very tight range between 40 and 60, 60 feet. When we looked by sex, um, females seem to, or I should say males, seem to exhibit more barotrauma than females. So the y-axis is percent of no barotrauma fish. Um, so possibly, um, unless we have a skewed data set, um, possibly those female are able to kind of um, not exhibit or be susceptible to that barotrauma, those symptoms that we see they can exhibit. So then we had to do um, this portion of the project, which seemed a little bit almost silly, but um, I've learned that you know if you make assumptions, it's always good to test those assumptions. But the idea was if you throw a fish back, so put your you know be in the position of an angler, you throw the fish back. What is the first possible barrier to this fish be, you know surviving and going back down to depth? And the first would be avian predation. So we have, um, the seagulls are pretty smart. We always talk about the perch pack offshore and you know, while it's perch fishing season, there's usually a congregation of boats out there. Seagulls know what a congregation of boats mean. It means people are fishing and they're going to throw those fish back. So we only used a couple of fish um, because we did not want to waste the fish either. And so we did throw them back in between nine and 12 seconds, fish were consumed by seagulls. So 100% of the time, we proved the point um, pretty quickly and we did not want to spend any more time on that. So then we moved on to the experimental part and we used what are called rapid descent cages. This is something that um, we designed here at the consortium. That is our field technician, Boris Kotevsky, who uh, now works for the Fish and Boat Commission. But he was really uh, instrumental in helping design these cages. And so it's approximately a two foot by two foot cage. We have weights along the bottom and a rebar frame. And then up here we just have a wooden frame that helps with it floating. And what we were able to do, it's almost like a fish elevator. So we would take these fish that were um, exhibiting barotrauma symptoms, we would place it inside the cage right here. You can see he's belly up. And on this crossbar we would have GoPro cameras. We would go ahead and activate the camera. Um, there is a little end, uh, opening here. We would kind of um, lace that shut so the fish could not get out. And then we would sink it back down to depth. And we would do all of this on the boat on the same day pretty quickly. And so you can see the cage is set down here. We're using another camera that is running along <laughs> in the, um, the float line right here. And so the cages would sit there. We would let it sit for three days. So we would deploy it on day one. We'd come back on day two and run an underwater camera down and check it to see if um, the fish were still viable. And then we'd come back on day three, check the cages, and retrieve them. So when we look at this, like I said, the fish isn't looking too good. And we would load, uh, there was a timing issue, so we would load anywhere from three to about six fish in these cages at one time. So when, this is a GoPro footage, and I was just taking still images, you can see we have three fish here, they're all belly up, and the current on the bottom of the lake, you could see them just kind of moving back and forth within the current. So then after 12 minutes, these are 
These are the fish right here. There's one right here, a second one, and a third one. So within 12 minutes, they were able to kind of recover from that barotrauma. Their stomachs went back into their bodies. They righted themselves, and they were swimming around like a completely normal fish again. Um, so that's pretty amazing if you think of not only the trauma that they went through, but their organs kind of coming out of their mouth or you know, having hemorrhaging or bulging eyes, and they're overcoming that and surviving. But not all were successful. So you can see this fish right here, the stomach is uh, protruding out of the mouth. We have four fish in there. We came back on day two. They were all, um, you know, mortalities. So then we really wanted to look at that because we had great success in the beginning and then that success really went downhill as the summer went on. Um, so this, this graph, although there's a lot going on, trust me, it's very understandable. So on the bottom axis we have the dates and then on the y axis we have the percent mortality. The blue bars are the mortality, so we can look at the fish that um, did not make it. The uh, red squares are the bottom water temperature, so that's an important part in this. And then the green triangles are the um, dissolved oxygen. And then the yellow diamonds scattered throughout, that is just the water depth for those fish. So just to keep in mind, that the yellow diamonds are kind of scattered all over, so that water depth is not really playing a role. But what is playing a role is you will see that as temperature increases, so that red line, as temperature increases, the dissolved oxygen decreases. And so we all know that relationship, they're, they're um, inversely proportional to each other. And when that happens, that dissolved oxygen decreasing, all of a sudden now we're getting 100% mortality, and no matter what we're doing, those fish um, just are not surviving. So as we look at um, the beginning of the season, when we do have higher dissolved oxygen, that allows the fish to be more robust, be able to like withstand the pressure and the stress of the, of the barotrauma, trauma and also recover. So I will make this reference just because it is football season, but if any of you guys watch football, a lot of those football players go into an oxygen tent afterwards because oxygen helps them recover more quickly um, from all of the bruises and whatever injuries they've gotten during the game. So we can even kind of bring that back to the fish that when they have a higher, when they're in an environment with a higher dissolved oxygen level, they're just more capable of withstanding um, those pressures and recovering. So then we did another portion to the experiment and this is where we used a vertical hoop net. Um, this net was about 60 feet tall and about three um, feet in diameter. And it had kind of the same setup where there was an opening right here. We placed fish in and then laced it shut. And so this is almost um, mimicking the idea that a angler is putting a fish back in the water. And are they even capable, so these are all barotrauma fish, are they even capable of making it back down into the water column? And um, we, again, we did this early in the season. This was a difficult setup and if anybody, like I know some of you guys in here work on Lake Erie, it's not always optimal weather, so we were only able to do this a couple times. But we put eight fish in here, so this is just preliminary um, kind of information. We put eight fish in here, all of them belly up, all of them barotrauma, uh, and actually there was three things that could happen. They could float at the surface and die, they could make their way back down, um, and possibly also be mortalities, or they could make their way back down and survive. And what we found was six out of eight of these fish actually made it all the way back down to, um, this was in about 60 feet of water, and were able to survive. Uh, we did place it about three feet um, below the water surface, and that was just to avoid the seagulls from, from having um, any issues with them. So this was, again, um, very surprising, and we also looked at that latent mortality with the cages and the, with this hoop net to see if, okay, you know, maybe they survived the first 10 minutes and righted themselves, but was there some kind of internal damage that maybe resulted in uh, mortality three days later? So we did the same here, and we found that those six fish did survive to day three. Again, when we look at the data, same type of graph, same um, legend to it, and we found that as the dissolved oxygen decreased, um, or temperature increased, the dissolved oxygen decreased, and we noticed that we did have higher mortality um, 
after that point. So I always said it was good that we did start this study as early as possible in the summer because everybody looked at that hoop net and said those fish are dead, you're going to come back and see dead fish. And when we came back and we actually saw um, some of those fish survived, it kind of disproved that assumption. However, if we would have started later in the season, 100% mortality, I probably would have got, I told you so, from our colleagues. So um, it was, it's a, interesting that we were able to catch that early on. Um, just from our head boats or our kind of larger party boats that take fish out, uh, we were able to just get an idea. So you have to think about these are um, maybe one-time anglers. You know, they come up and maybe just go out a handful of times a summer. We brought those fish back. And just some preliminary data, um, there is a charter in the morning and the afternoon, a uh, number of observers on the boat, which was our staff, the water dump, and then the total number of fish caught. And you will see that there is um, there was no fish caught in July in the afternoon. That really didn't have anything to do with the afternoon, but instead, um, for the last couple of years, yellow perch anglers um, anglers have had more of a challenge catching yellow perch. And part of that we suspect is due from. So I only presented phase one today, but phase two we saw that there was a large population of spiny water fleas. And these fish were just gorging themselves on spiny water fleas where you would pull them up on the boat and they would just be regurgitating them. So um, it was much more difficult to angle for them at that time because why spend the energy on chasing a uh, minnow on a hook when you don't have to? All right, um, so some recommendations. This was you know, the idea that could be made for anglers is one, first and foremost, just keep all your catch. And that can be difficult because yellow perch, the smaller ones or the dinks, you know, they're sometimes not always worth doing the, the flaying part. But if you can, keep all your, keep all your catch. Um, if you are catching a lot of the smaller ones, then maybe change locations and try to find a different school. But there are other devices out there, so if you think not just Great Lakes, but if you, or Lake Erie, if you think out in the ocean, they're catching fish at one, two, three hundred feet and sometimes they're getting um, fish that they don't want to target or capture. And they have these different devices here where you can clip the fish um, on the lip, take it back down to depth, and then release it, send down kind of a weight, um, release it. Or something as simple as almost like our, um, our cages that we had, but an upside down um, milk crate and just sink them back down and hopefully if it's early enough in the season and temperatures are cool enough and dissolved oxygen um, is such, then, then there's a chance for survival there. Future studies, we'd like to continue this project. Um, I will make one mention that um, when we had the best survival rate, we actually held them on the boat the longest. So that was the big question, was how long did we hold them on the boat? Um, our most successful days, we held these fish in a five gallon bucket for almost an hour. So it was about 55 minutes. Later in the season, we were holding them for less than 10 minutes and we were not having such success. And then um, we would hope that we could capture data earlier in the season. Oops, sorry. All right, I think I have time for like one quick question or you're welcome to ask me questions after the break as well. Any questions for anyone? My turn, Jeanette. <laughs> No, I just have a basic question. Maybe I missed it. Did you, uh, the number of males versus females, just because I've heard from um, local anglers that they think something's going with the sex ratio, I just think it's like females because they're bigger. Um, but did you guys figure out like the rate? Was there anything with the ratio between females and males? No, we were catching know? about the same. Okay. Yeah, there wasn't a significant difference between the number that we caught of males and females. So the, the field changes were not really large, right? They from like 10 to 8. I didn't, yeah. So I didn't. It, it, and it's not quite down to sort of hypoxic levels, but maybe stress levels. But And it's not a huge change, you know, right? But, but it seemed to have that big of an impact. Yeah, and I don't know if we were kind of at the tail end of it. So if you could see earlier, you would, you know, we're just catching the very tail end and then it, it just flips, or, yeah, I'm not sure. All right, thank you very much.